so no normally I, I hate standing behind lecterns. Um, in fact, I can't stand it, which is why I, um, I'm going to do it and hopefully do a good job of it tonight. Look, I, um, I have led a very interesting life. Um, the majority of people out there back at home in New Zealand wouldn't have a clue as to what I've been disrupting and, and been cunningly doing now for the last 15 years. Um, and when Kia asked me to come and speak at this thing tonight, I decided, well, well, actually, Napeta sent me a, um, a document about four or five pages long. Now, if you know me, you know I don't get past the first sentence of anything, um, uh, particularly if it's um, going to be really, really boring. You know in the first sentence, right, of an email if it's going to be one of those emails that's going to cause you an immense amount of, of work and effort. Um, so I decided to do a um, bit of a scan on the four-page document about what I should be speaking about and, and in order to come up with a, a single word that permeated the document other than and, the, or, or is. Um, and the word I came up with was inspire. So obviously it matched what's going on tonight. And what I want to do is, is tell you a little bit about me, my story, my journey, the lessons that I've learned, what I've been involved in, and where to next in terms of what I see um, on the event horizon. So hopefully you'll drink a little bit more liquor because as Prince Tui Tika used to say, I f I f I'm a lot more funnier when, I've had, when my audience have had a few drinks. Um, in doing so, I want to take you right back to the very beginning of where I came from. It's, um, I won't take you right back to Eldersley Hospital in good old little Upper Hut, um, but I'm going to um, provide you with a step on my entrepreneur's journey because it did start at a very early age. So I grew up in the 1980s, and I'm very proud of being a product of the 1980s. I'm not a 70s child. I'm certain, I wish I was a 90s child. I'd be a little bit younger. Um, but I'm an 80s child, and I grew up in a New Zealand that was undergoing an immense amount of change. Um, it was a social and economic transformation of our movement from uh, Rob Muldoon, good old piggy, uh, and uh, on the cusp of this incredibly interesting Labour government run by a fellow called David Longy. And there was nothing wrong with that, you know, the country needed to undergo a bit of change, but there was not much money left aside for whatever else we wanted to do, or you know, go on holidays or even buy a new pair of sneakers for, for, the, uh, for tennis. So there are a whole lot of things that were going on in the 1980s that really set my view of how the world works. Um, and I guess it inspired me to do a couple of things, to try and figure out a way of buying stuff that meant that I didn't have to rely on my parents to buy it for me, knowing full well that they just didn't have any money. So I decided I didn't know what it was called back then, but now I call it entrepreneurism. Um, but back then, I just thought of stuff that I could make a quick buck from and, uh, and buy other stuff with. Um, and so my first business was when I was about 10 years old. Um, so that's a picture of the Birchville picnic area where I grew up in Upper Hutt. And I was mucking around in my grandmother's garage, um, well, as you do when you're a young teenage boy. I won't tell you what else was going on in that garage. But... We were mucking around in my um, grandmother's garage and there were all these pot plant holders, you know, the plastic things. So they were just sitting there in copious amounts because um, you know, grandparents tend to do a lot of gardening when they retire. So she had surplus stock of pot plant holders. Now, conveniently, we live next door to a reserve. What, what do you call that here in Australia? A national park? Uh, and this national park had an abundance of product called native plants. So I figured pot plant holders, pot plants... Let's do this, right? And so I became a door-to-door -door salesman when I was about 10 or 11, and I'd walk up and down the streets of Gemstone Drive and Parkdale and good old Upper Hutt, and I'd be selling my pot plants for two bucks. My biggest mistake was knocking on the door of a city council worker. <laughs> um, and about three days later, they knocked on my parents' door, and that's when I found uh, out that there was this word that existed called illegal. So unfortunately, my first business kind of like floundered. I did make a little bit of money out of it, but I got out of the pot plant business relatively early on. Then we got into the golf balling business. Um, when we discovered from old Trevor at Maidstone Book and Sports in Upper Hutt that you could, he would buy used golf balls for a dollar. So we had another problem. Mum and Dad used to make us clean up all the dog crap out in the backyard, which I thoroughly hated. Um, so I thought, well, bugger this. Let's go up to the golf course and see if we can get a whole lot of balls really, really quickly. So we'd go out into the backyard, we'd collect up all the dog crap, put it all into plastic bags, go up to the Timaru golf course, and then we'd put it all into the golf holes. And so when somebody was putting for their, um, for their ball, they'd go into the golf hole, they'd pick it up, oh, throw it away, and these little merry boys would be running, 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 chasing these golf balls and then taking them down to Trevor at Maidstone Book and Sports. 
And in fact, Trevor years later would say to me, there was something really smelly about what we were doing. <laughs> but again, like all things, we kind of like got caught out and it was kind of all over before it began. But it was good money because I learned all about a volume-based business very, very early on. Um, then at school, something really fascinating happened. I was privileged enough to go to a, a place called St. Patrick's College in Silver Street. And part of our business studies course um, was all about forming a board, forming a business, and actually selling something to your fellow students. Um, now, they don't do that anymore, and I lament that. I think they should definitely do that sort of thing because I learned a lot. Anyway, so our business was the boxer short business. It was the 90s by that stage. Boxer shorts and patterned elephants and things like that were in for boys. I don't know about girls. It was a boys' school, so I don't know about girls' underwear too much. And anyway, so we, would, um, we rang up Haynes, the, um, the boxer short company, and, and they gave us all this free product for free, right? All this product for free, but we later learned it was samples only, so it was also a limited supply. So our boxer short business at St. Patrick's College in Silverstream was born, and unfortunately for us, we only ever sold the stock we had, i.e. the free stuff, collected more money than we had, so the next lesson I learned in business was uh, not to sell something that you didn't actually have to give. So I learned all of these lessons by the time I was 16, and then something remarkable happened. Um, I discovered computers. Now, I, um, my parents scrimped and saved to buy us um, a compact presario, for those of you who have been around the tech industry long enough. Um, and on this compact presario, I was just so enamoured. So the thing you've got to know about me is school didn't agree with me, and I didn't agree with school. By the way, just to be very clear, I have no post-school qualifications whatsoever. All right? So I don't want you to think I'm some kind of intelligent, qualified individual. I'm not. So this compact presario, though, it wasn't school, and it enabled me to learn stuff like programming and coding things. And my little brother and I came up with the very first, what we would think, was the very first travel site. Because we wanted to travel and have adventures. We couldn't afford to travel and have adventures. Um, so we thought, wouldn't it be great if we took imagination and created an online travel site? Well, it was a little bit too early. The internet obviously hadn't been born yet, um, and we were probably sitting on something that could have quite possibly have been called Lonely Planet today. But that computer opened up my, my eyes to a brand new world out there that was changing. It was no longer about books and things like that, conventional thinking. Um, and so the Compact Presario was one of those light bulb moments that really changed my life about where things would head. So failing all of that, um, something remarkable happened. Um, I went back away from being an entrepreneur and all of a sudden I was working at the Department of Social Welfare, granting unemployment benefits, DPBs and special purpose benefits. Um, I was confronted by people every day coming in and wanting a food grant. Look, I'm unemployed, I'd like to apply for the UB. And I did this for a couple of years before I got jack of it and decided maybe corporate life is better. So I managed to talk my way into a job at the Bank of New Zealand um, and I was all of a sudden granting personal loans and mortgages and all this other sort of stuff. And what I soon realised is that banking was kind of like another form of social welfare. People were still coming to you asking you for money and you still had to take an application form and either give them something or not. And so I decided, oh, maybe I've made the wrong decision here. So I came to this conscious point in my life where I decided New Zealand just didn't have the appeal that I, I wanted. There was something bigger, and I didn't know quite what it was, but I wanted to go on some adventures, and I thought the best way I could do that is to leave home. Uh, so I um, packed up my backpack, literally packed a backpack, um, I put a whole lot of books into it. I got to the Air New Zealand counter at Wellington Airport, and when they told me that it was going to cost me another $200 for the weight, I quickly threw all the books out. Um, but I left New Zealand um, now nearly 15 years ago, uh, and I left with a Bank of New Zealand credit card, $2,500, uh, and I stayed in a very dodgy motel up in Crown Street um, here in Surrey Hills called the Crown Street Motel. Now, I'd never been overseas before in my entire life, right? Never, ever before. Now, if you've been to the Crown Street Motel in recent years, you'll find that it's now hipsterized. Uh, it's certainly nothing like it used to be. So I'd never been out of New Zealand before. I'd never um, had an adventure. I didn't even have a passport back then. I certainly had not nearly enough money that I thought I would need to, to get along. So before I got on the plane, I, I decided what I'll do is I'll try and Get, a, get myself ahead, try and get a job before I even land in Australia. 
And so I looked at all the recruitment companies in Australia and Sydney, uh, and I came across this one called IT&T Recruitment. Anyway, so before I rang this guy, Justin Whelan, who would later become one of my best friends in the world, uh, I decided I had to convince Justin that I was already in Sydney, and the only way I could probably do that is if I pretended like I spoke like an Australian. Because I didn't want him to think that I was still over in good old little upper hut ringing from my mother's phone trying to get a job. So I did, and I convinced Justin that I uh, was in Sydney, and I sent him my resume and my CV, um, and when I landed, um, within two weeks, I had my first job, ironically enough, at the sister company to IT&T Recruitment called IT&T Education. And then what happened is, I'll try and skip through this a, a, a little faster because I've got some other points I want to make. Then what happened is my journey here in Australia and in the world really honestly did begin. So I'm at a, a Christmas function at an organisation called Powerland. For those of you who are in the IT industry, you might have heard of Powerland. Uh, and Powerland was the parent company to this, um, uh, this company um, that I just started working for as a business development manager. Now, just to some additional context, right? When I was working for the Bank of New Zealand, I was on like 28,000 New Zealand dollars, and I thought back then that was pretty big money. All of a sudden, I was on $65,000 plus this incredibly interesting thing called superannuation, working for an IT&T education company that I'd never had any idea what I was selling or what I was really doing. But that didn't stop me because, by God, have I got some balls. So at the Christmas party at Powerland, I decided there was this guy called Theo Baker, the managing director. What if I went up and I said to Theo that I think you could run a much better business um, all you need to do is give me the role as the head of IT&T Education. And I'll turn it around for you. And by the way, mate, I'll make you a lot of money in the process. Now, so convinced was I that this would work, all I had to do was choose my moment in time. So I waited until near enough the end of the night when Theo was rip-roaring drunk. And I went to him with my pitch. And by Monday um, of the following week, I was the new general manager of IT&T Education. Now, I'd noticed a few things with IT&T education, though. It was broken. There were some things wrong. They weren't selling enough products. Um, they weren't doing enough training. They weren't doing enough of what they should have been doing. And so I thought, well, how hard can this be to bring a new lens onto this and to try and fix it up a little bit? So my time at IT&T education was remarkable because that's when I really learned how to actually run a business. It was no longer makeup. It was no longer make-believe. I had to do things. I had to manage people. And I also had to return on the investment that the managing director had decided to make in me. But unfortunately for Theo, I met another Maori guy while working at Powerland called uh, Kane Robinson and an Auckland bloke called uh, Gavin Matthews. And we decided that quite possibly we could take Theo on at his own game. I mean, why not? Uh, we see some inherent problems across his business. And so in a very cold morning in Carlingford um, in the outer suburbs of Sydney, we hatched a plan to build a business called Datatech. Um, and data tech was this remarkable thing. We certainly didn't have any capital. I mean, I didn't even realise what capital was back then, right? I thought we could just run stuff and get it going, and I didn't realise that we'd have to make sure we paid each other a wage to make sure the bills were, were paid. But nonetheless, um, three of us sat in a room in, in, uh, in Carlingford, and data tech was born, and we decided, because no one really knew us, the only way that we could become known is by running something so big and so kick-ass that no one would forget us, we'd make a lot of money in the process, and people would actually think we were always part of the furniture. Oh, there's those guys again. They've been around for a while, even though we'd only really been in the country for, what, less than 12 months. So uh, we'd, we came across this thing called knowledge management. Now, knowledge management uh, 15 years ago was a burgeoning thing. People were mucking around with content management and document management and all this other sort of stuff. Now, I found knowledge management by playing around on the old Yahoo search engines. And I came to the conclusion that there was not much out there. There was a lot of people talking about it. This is something that we could hitch our wagon around. And so we came up with this crafty, cunning idea to bring to Australia the Global Knowledge Management Conference 2001. Now, what's really amazing about this is that uh, I will, all of a sudden I was the chair of this international conference, so it was kind of like I had instant credibility, even though I didn't, right? Um, and all of a sudden we were running around trying to convince people to give us again a whole lot of free stuff to get our speakers here and all the rest of it. 
Anyway, at the end of the day, Air yeah, New Zealand chipped in a whole lot of free airfares. Um, I played to that, that very Māori-centric, oh, you've got to support a Māori business, bro. Come on, give us a few free airfares. <laughs> Uh, and they certainly copped up, so credit to you, New Zealand, for that. Um, but I also learned that don't get a whole lot of corporate speakers in, because then we'd actually probably have to pay them. So we decided we'd get a whole lot of big government people, public servants in, because we know not only could we not, did we not have to pay them a speaker's fee, um, we'd also probably not have to give them the free air tickets to, to run to, to get to the conference, because public servants have to pay for their own stuff for the sake of not being seen to take an inducement. Anyway, um, at the conference, we had the Chief Knowledge Officer of the Department of the Navy. Uh, we had the Director of Knowledge Management from the National Defence University in Washington, D.C. Uh, we had the Chief Knowledge Officer of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission from the United States, and the list just went on. Um, and of course, because I was the contact point, all of a sudden, I was also building my own network at the time. So the power of being creative about building connections and networks is so fundamentally important for everything. Now, the conference um, made us a, a profit of $380,000, um, and that was just incredible. But importantly, knowledge management wasn't the game we ended up in. In fact, one of our sponsors was a South Korean guy I'd met in a bar in Hong Kong on the, on the juice. Um, he handed me a business card. We were both paralytically drunk by the end of the evening. Um, and, of course, he became my, uh, my business partner today, in fact, Austin Kim. Now, at the time, he was the general manager of Samsung Asia Pacific. So there's another thing. You know, make sure you get somebody's business card in the bar, even if you are paralytically drunk, because it will prompt your memory in the morning. Anyway, so we convinced Austin to come on this journey as a sponsor to our knowledge management conference. And by the end of our little adventure with DataTech, all of a sudden, we had created SamsungConsumables.com. Now, it doesn't exist anymore, um, but the other thing I learned, and I think Samsung learned a few lessons from this experience as well, is that they, uh, they gave us the naming rights to the business, and we actually also own the domain name. And all they wanted in return is for us to exclusively sell their, sell their stuff. So we actually became the very first online retail site in Australia, and now obviously Samsung have it back. And I won't go into the, the rigmarole of, of how successful that little adventure was. Suffice to say, um, the things that I learned back in the day about building connections and networks was also the fact that I still had to deliver. So it was one thing that Samsung would give us ownership of samsungconsumables.com. We also had to make sure that we continuously delivered. By the time everything had finished, um, Kane and myself and Gavin had gone our separate ways. Um, Kane and Gavin went into the security infrastructure business and I decided to play around with something brand new. Because again, if it's one thing you're going to learn from the, per the person that I have become, it's I'm not interested in what's happening today, I'm interested in what's happening tomorrow, and in 5 and in 10 and even 50 years' time. That's the stuff that keeps me interested. So we came across this technology called Voice XML back in 2003, 2004. So the translation of speech to text and text to speech. Now, I'm not a technology person from the point that I will sit there and I will code this technology. I was the marketing guy. So how can we sell this thing? So I came together with a bloke called Neville Book, um, who was X Syntropy by that, uh, sorry, X uh, Solution 6 by that stage, and we decided how cool would it be to sell this stuff to government departments, but how will we sell it? So we came up with this interesting concept called OSCA, uh, which is the Overseas Citizens Advisory Register. Well, actually, the names came later. We just saw OSCA was a pretty cool name, and it was one of, one of, um, one of Neville's cousins or nieces or something or other. <laughs> Anyway, so um, we came up with this thing, Oscar, and fortuitously, and also unfortunately, it was just after the Bali bombings, um, and so we came up with an idea that if we could warn Australian citizens, no matter where they were, by sending them both a text message, but also an interactive voice message directly to their mobile phone handset, then we could actually save lives. And thankfully, the Department of Defence and, the, and the, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade bought the idea, and then all of a sudden, we were into IVR and voice XML all over the place. Now, we exited that business when we sold it to a North American company called Audium Group, and I think Audium are now owned by Cisco. The, um, the next idea I had was, how hard can this adventure be around education systems? Um, so again, New Zealand was a, actually a in really interesting pay place. So back in the day, uh, I don't know what the, what the situation is in New Zealand at the moment, but back in the day, student management was still managed largely by physical paper-based records, right? 
Um, so we came up with, well, not me personally, but a company that I went to then work with and support called MXL had designed and developed a piece of technology that could move student management systems online. And interestingly enough, that's when I first came across a guy called Kevin Ackhurst, um, who uh, you heard from earlier on, and became familiar with something called Microsoft's Learning Gateway. Now, I didn't go forward with the MXL venture, but the thing I learned about was bundling, and bundling would become critically important to what I would learn later on. So after a while, I got this reputation here in Australia for going in and horizoning stuff, of rebuilding stuff, of repurposing, repurposing stuff. Um, I don't like to be called a change manager, though. So I get a phone call from a, uh, a bloke who I'd never heard of, um, a company that I'd never engaged with in an industry that I'd never belonged to, uh, and that was called Drake International. So who's heard of Drake? All right, quite a few people. So Drake International, just for a bit of context, Drake is the oldest vampire in the recruitment coven, had been established, yeah, having been established in Canada after World War II. Now, the reason Drake was established was a very simple idea. And the very simple idea was that women had been working in the war effort in factories and in office blocks and in institutions while the men were off fighting. But all of a sudden, the war had ended. So what to do with all these women that effectively had become surplus because men were coming back into their traditional roles? So Bill Pollock, the founder of Drake International, came up with the concept of recruitment and putting women to work in white-collar jobs, and that's how Drake came about. So anyway, I'm sitting in Canberra, I'm mucking around, I'm, I'm overcharging people with consulting invoices, and I get this phone call from this, this bloke called Bill Pollock, and he says to me, look, I've heard a little bit about what you do. Um, I've got a bit of a problem. Would you come down to Melbourne and meet with me? And so I just rattled off the tongue and I said, not a problem. Um, my charge is $385 now, 38.5 .8, hours for the week. It'll take a week for me to come down and meet with you, reflect on what our meeting has, and you've got to pay it up front. So he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got the business class airfares in there as well, eh? but I didn't. I wasn't that quick. So anyway, I, I go down to Drake and um, he puts me into this room of general managers um, and there are general managers aplenty in this very old style traditional business. The biggest problem with Drake International was it not only had been the first vampire in the recruitment coven, um, it had also trained every other vampire in the recruitment coven. So all of our competitors around the world, wherever they might be, um, you'll find Drake International people um, permeate their ranks. So I'm sitting there one day and I'm listening to him, I'm listening to all his general managers and quite honestly, they're talking a whole lot of crap. Now, I didn't expect this to be a long-term engagement. He wanted me to be blunt with him. We went next door into his office. He said, what did you think about that meeting there, Matthew? So he's like 81 years old at that stage, right? So he's not a, a young fella. What do, you, what do you think there, Matthew? And I said, well, I think they're talking a whole lot of nonsense, Bill. In fact, I'd probably sack them all now and walk them out the door. Your biggest problem is... They're blaming their staff and their people. They're not blaming themselves for their own bad performance. A couple of months later, after a few other discussions, Bill Pollock made me a offer I just couldn't refuse. And at the age of 33, all of a sudden, I was running a multi-billion dollar global corporation. Now, to put a non too fine a story on it, the company had been losing a significant amount of money for a long period of time. And the one thing I did that stood above all other things in reforming that business was sacking those general managers and sending a very clear message to the staff that I was all about them and not about what was going on up here. The other critical time was it was the global financial crisis was just beginning. Um, so all of a sudden, if you're in the business of employment, you're pretty screwed, right? Unless, again, you reform yourself and have a look at where to next. And so Drake International today is a product of the reforms that occurred. So even though the company had been losing a large and significant amount of money, um, by the end of my tenure, um, the company had re returned to full profitability. Um, in fact, I think we achieved full profitability across all branches, across all networks and industry groups um, by November of 2009. That's a remarkable achievement. And I did so by not sacking one frontline worker, got rid of a few managers, one frontline worker, and I never closed one mainland branch here in Australia at all. In fact, my competitors did. There was a guy running Kelly, um, Kelly Group. Have you heard of Kelly? Yeah, there was a guy running Kelly Group, and um, I heard rumours that they were willing to pull out, or they were ready to pull out of Darwin. So I rang him up, and I made a cheeky offer, and I said, here's the deal, James. If you give me whatever temp recruitment business you've got remaining in Darwin, I'll give you a residue margin um, for the next two months. 
And he said, well, I won't wear that. I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, I don't think you've got a choice because I've just gone and employed another business development manager. So either I can pay you a margin and we can do some business or alternatively, I'll just get my person to knock on every door of each one of your customers across the Northern Territory and take it. Um, now, after a few weeks, um, James acquiesced. We're great mates now, by the way. I don't want you to think it was all dirty business. Um, but the, the fact is, you've got to create, a, a, at times that are confronting, new and creative ways of actually surviving. And that's what we did through the Drake International years. Um, I retired from Drake International in, um, in January of 2010. I love using the word retired. I'm not one of these chief executives that... Uh, that was thrown out the door because all of a sudden the shareholder value had depleted so much that the board wanted my blood and shareholders were buying at the door. Um, I decided to leave because it was time to go and that was another important lesson that I've learned in life so far. And by time to go, my skill set is only relevant to the time that the problem occurs in a business or the issues of the times that the company is confronting. Uh, and so after I'd rebuilt the business, it was time for an operational manager I'm not an operations manager, I'm a marketing sales type character. And so I left um, Drake International in 2000 and sorry, at, yeah, 2010, and I decided that um, something really important happened. I decided that there was a point in my career that a light bulb went off. And it's a very unusual light bulb, and I hope everybody in the room experiences this at a point in their working life or, or life in general. And that is, at some point, I had the ability to pick up a phone make a phone call and call people to action, whether it was a minister of the crown or another chief executive or a supplier or somebody else. And so I decided that what I would do is turn that into something more interesting. Money wasn't the, the motivating factor for everything I was doing at that point. In fact, another lesson I'd like you to take away, if you focus success around money, you'll never actually get there. But if you focus on just being successful, then money as a result will always come. So I'm more in the latter camp, I'm certainly not in the former camp. So one of the things I'd also done during my time at Drake, though, to inform me about where I would go next, was we decided that one of our competitive advantages would be to enter this world of corporate social responsibility and corporate citizenship. Because in every tender I was reading during 2008 and into 2009, and by the way, we're talking about three to four hundred million dollar tenders, we're not talking about a couple of hundred thousand dollars or even a few million dollars. Everyone wanted to know what our CSR and sustainability credentials were. Now, of course, if you're in the recruitment business, your first thing is to, to default action to the marketing strategy um, and then try and create some raw emotion around the marketing strategy to convince people you're actually doing something. We decided we weren't going to do that, that we'd enter the world of CSR but in a safe way. And that's how I came to be in the United Nations Global Compact and signed Drake up to it. Now, the Drake International experience means that I, I saw the world through different eyes from a business perspective, but in understanding the world of the United Nations Global Compact, I also understood fundamentally the role of business and industry in solving other big problems of our time. Poverty alleviation, empowering women and girls in developing countries. And one of the issues we were dealing with is I couldn't understand why a woman in Saudi Arabia um, could start her own business, but then her husband had to drive her to her place of work because she's not allowed to drive a car. So that all became absolutely foreign to me and I thought to myself, how could we change that? So I came up with the idea of the Sustain Group and it's now one of the largest social investment businesses in the Southern Hemisphere. And what we do is we work with business and industry um, to prove that the investments that they are making are actually having a credible and social impact. So, you know, we're not going to build a school unless we're going to be able to fund the payroll of the teachers who are standing in the classrooms. Um, we're interested in whether or not kids have achieved literacy and numeracy outcomes of whether girls in developing countries, particularly places like Afghanistan, uh, are able to uh, stay at school longer than nine years old and go right through to 16. So the Sustain Group was a collaboration, uh, I guess, a, a construction of everything that I had seen and then that light bulb moment of being able to make a difference. And then about 16 weeks ago, I was completely bored and I decided... Um, let's have another one, uh, and all of a sudden the EntreHub was born. Now the EntreHub comes from a very simple proposition. I just could not spend any more time in one-on-one -on -one coffees with people who wanted to know how to raise capital or how to put together a business plan, and I'd even come out of all of those coffee sessions having bought the coffee. It was, uh, I, was, I, I was like time poor and prohibited from doing a lot of stuff. 
And so I decided I'd come up with this concept by getting people to join a network, which meant that I could filter the work out to other people in my network to do the things that I didn't necessarily have to do. Because I do know all of these people. I know people who can raise capital, I know people who can run a business, understand cash flow management. I don't necessarily have to be the only guy, and I'll get to that point in a minute. So today, 16 weeks later, after a very sophisticated and cunning Kiwi-backed social media strategy, we now have 34,000 members across 81 countries around the world and growing. So not a bad achievement. So if you go to entrehub.org, it's very much about news and information and passing bites of learning. It's not really a product that we're trying to sell. It's more about trying to teach the very lessons that we have all learned as entrepreneurs in the network. So there are seven things, therefore, in my life so far that I've learned, because I'm going to be like 40 in a couple of days. So I'm feeling a little bit old and misguided and in between at the moment. So the things that I've learned so far, number one, procrastination is evil. If you sit down and procrastinate over making a decision, you'll never actually make the decision. So yes, think about things and sort out all the different scenarios, but procrasti procrastination is absolutely evil. Failure happens. That's the other really important lesson I've learned so far. Um, look, I'm a failure. I've been a failure. I've got no doubt that I'm going to fail again. And I'm okay with that because I know each time I fail, I learn another lesson. I mean, the lesson I learned from the boxer short business back is w when I was a teenager, like I said before, is not to sell something that you don't actually have. So failure is fine. Preparation, stop thinking and starting writing your ideas down. I mean, it, it amazes me the number of people that go to bed of a night and they say, oh, I just had a wonderful idea. They go to sleep and it's gone. You know, write it down, pull your iPad out or your Android or whatever it is you've got in your, in your, your shop and, and write it down and get it on pieces of paper. Um, don't think you know everything. I used to be quite an arrogant little fella. I thought I actually did know everything. And the lessons that I learned through failure is that in fact I don't and the best thing I can do is surround myself with people who fill the gaps in my own knowledge. So if I don't know something, I now go out there and I acquire those people to come on the journey with me to fill the very gaps that I have. The other thing too, and I'll, I'll be quick about this, is don't build something in the expectation that all of a sudden they're just going to come. You know, Samsung Consumables was a fantastic idea, but I lament the fact we could have become absolutely filthy, wonderfully rich off the back of the proposition, but we essentially built it in the hope people would just float to us. Well, that was silly too. So don't build something on the expectation that all of a sudden it'll come. You've got to go out there and work for it. So what I want to um, f uh, finish with is a couple of slides about disruption. So I'm a disruptive kind of person, right? I don't think that anything that I do today is conventional because I refuse to think in a conventional way. The moment you put your conventional hat on is the moment that you start living in the past and certainly not the future. So the majority of people live in this circle over in the corner, right? It's called the conventional world. We think in all the, the same ways that our parents and grandparents wanted to. Um, but in doing so, they're always working for somebody else, doing something for someone else all the time, constantly. My view is the real magic happens is when you throw that convention to the wind and start disrupting the hell out of convention. To give you another couple of examples, just before I close down, um, this convention doesn't mean that it's just about entrepreneurship and building a successful business and creating wealth for you and your family and your friends and all this other sort of thing. You can also use disruptive thinking in a social good kind of way as well. So I play and work in two different worlds. I play in the social entrepreneurship world and the entrepreneurship world. Four years ago, when me and a mate decided we wanted to get into the business of suicide prevention because we were both touched by it, um, we jumped on the board of Suicide Prevention Australia. It was a broken organisation. It was 25 years old. It lost its way. They were fighting with each other. The board was a mixed match of woolly, jumpered, not-for-profit sector people. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with woolly, jumpered, not-for-profit people, but... What I'm saying is nothing got done. It was like everything happened in a committee meeting for committee's sake. Um, so we were on the verge of closure. It was essentially an organisation um, also losing its relevancy and credibility. The facts, though, were really astounding in that seven people take their lives. Um, and here in Australia, that equates to 2,500 people per year taking their life. Now, the impact to the productivity of the economy is massive, but also the sense of purpose and place for family and friends when somebody takes their life is just huge. 
So we thought, how the hell can we change this? Because everybody in the not-for-profit sector competes with each other, just like we in business compete with each other. Be under no illusion. In fact, those people in the community sector are more competitive than I'll ever be with each other. The reality is, though, that we had this problem. How do we deal with it? So we stopped calling ourselves a not-for-profit. That was the first thing. The second thing is we decided to change ourselves from being a not-for-profit to a company limited by guarantee. Our members became shareholders and we had to return the investments that were being made into us. Completely disruptive sort of thinking for the times. Today, we've brought the sector together. We have a joint national um, approach and program to reduce suicide in Australia by half within the decade. And from a business perspective, we've gone from being flat broke to last financial year making a profit of $436,000 that we're now reinvesting into research activities, the development of small towns, toolkits, you name it. So what I'm also saying is you can take the lessons that you learn in business and apply them to a social good, which is now what I'm attempting to do as well. The same was true of the United Nations Global Compact. How do we impact uh, poverty and alleviate poverty? How do we empower women? How do we do all of these things? Well, let's cast a business lens over this. Let's have a look and see whether or not some viable programs can work. And now we've got roughly about 118 programs and initiatives across 101 global compact networks around the world where business are working in partnership with civil society. Again, disruptive thinking when you think about the world of the United Nations. And let me tell you, last year, in 2013, I ran the largest reform project in the United Nations institution in probably the last 30 years um, of trying to build frameworks and networks of cohesiveness and all sorts of different things. I've never seen such a bureaucratic organisation in my entire life. And so that was the problem. The challenge for the UN is still relevancy and credibility. So finally, I want to end on this. Um, that's been my journey so far. Um, I've got another journey of a thousand years to go because one of the technologies I'm investing in has come from the Futurama cartoon program where you just take a pickled head and put it on a robot. No? No takers? <laughs> yeah, that was a consumer survey just then. <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the other things that I'm working on, though, is understanding the power of cloud technology. We're having a look at, at how you can increase the viability and uptake of apps. There are 800,000 apps in the Apple Store, 800,000 apps in the, uh, in the Android Store, but really I think about only 80 of them ever breach the million dollar revenue mark. So we're trying to have a look at whether or not there are apps out there that are just missing the boat because their marketing and strategy, uh, social media engagement strategies are crap, um, or whether or not they're just bad apps. So we're looking at identifying a whole lot of things. And so we started up a, uh, a little incubation company in Mountain View, California about three years ago. And one of the really interesting projects we, we've got a team working on at the moment is the harnessing of brainwave technology. I love a pair of Google Glasses, by the way, if anyone's got some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll give you an apple. <laughs> um, so what I'm, what I'm saying or suggesting is that whatever's happening today is quite irrelevant in my world. I'm more interested in what's happening into the future. The mission statement I want to leave you with, though, comes from Life magazine, who shut its doors back in 1972. Because the other final lesson I've learned in my journey so far to date is you've got to have a mission statement. You've got to be very clear about where you're heading and why. And so even though I might have left you with a bit of an illusion that I've made a lot of this up over the course of the last 15 years as I've gone along, the truth is I have not. I've known exactly where I will be in every five-year cycle of my life. I know that I need to get to the next stage of my five-year cycle within four years because I need to reflect on whether or not I've been successful in the endeavour. I've known exactly what relationships I've needed to build and why along the way, and I think that sometimes gets lost in a lot of us. Purposeful, goal-setting action is more important than just making it up as you go along. So thank you for listening to me.